you would, do you want to come up and speak one at a time? Maybe you can do that. Thank you. It's been a, a wonderful weekend, a very rich. And we're supposed to speak to what we know and what we need to do. And I just want to review this terrible list that I have, the characteristics of fascism. Enforced patriotism, hyper-nationalism, disdain for human rights, control of mass media, creation of laws designed to enrich corporations and exempt them from labor, health, and environmental standards, rampant sexism, promotion of religious fundamentalism, creation of a fear-based society, fixation on national security and law and order, attempts to achieve worldwide military power, disdain for intellectuals and the arts, corrupt fraudulent elections, obsession with seeking out enemies and scapegoats, fear, hatred of foreigners, always having a need to invoke the enemy, the setting up of internal surveillance, harassment of citizen groups, expanded prisons, development of a thug class, private contractors, target, the targeting of key individuals, control of the press, engaging in arbitrary detention and release, the treatment of dissidents as if they were um, create, um, committing treason, and suspension of the rule of law. And we have Guantanamo, we have the NDAA, we have NASA surveillance. We can go on and on. I just had a beautiful visit with Dan Berrigan, and we were sitting there thinking, what is, what is the obstacle to world peace? And Dan simply said, America. And Kathy Green and I, came away from that visit with these words, these very few words of his, the only way to challenge the evil is through faith. And so I want to go down through, after going through that horrible list of fascism, which we're in the advanced stages of, I would like to talk about the Catholic social teachings, human dignity, the rights and responsibilities that go with that the participation as community members that we all must have, the, the preferential option for the poor. These are the basic tenets that as Catholics, those of us who are Catholics have been given. We've been given the Sermon on the Mount. We've been given um, the gospel understanding of how we treat each other. We have been given the understanding that we are all part of the mystical body of each other and that we are all in a conversion together and this has to occur in community. And so I would, I would just simply end with, we are called to become servants. Um, we are called to demonstrate servant leadership we are called to sow, but we are not going to necessarily be the ones to reap. And at times it looks very hopeless, but we are also called to not fall into the powerlessness of losing our faith, our hope, and our love for each other. Dr. King said uh, in the St. Riverside Church, speech that uh, all must protest. Everyone must do it in our own way, but all must protest. It is an imperative. It is not an elective. Uh, we have no choice. Our humanity depends on it. We need to protest. But the hard question about what each of us must do is something that we, that, that, uh, we all need to do that work and find out what that is. And uh, with, we, without alibi. There, there's a bumper sticker some years ago that purported to answer this question, and I was always less than satisfied with it. I'm sure you'll remember. It said, uh, think globally and act locally. Yeah. And I thought, what a you know, false dichotomy, a false... You know, it's like you could just as easily put it, switch it around. <laughs> it would be just as good advice to, to uh, think locally and act globally. 
And in uh, my life as an activist, I live in a small farm town of 40 people, and uh, I've been elected mayor of that town twice. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been deported from Bahrain and Honduras and Israel. Uh, I've also had the example of people, and I'm thinking of, of our friend Kathy Kelly, and I'm thinking too of the, of the um, talk that Kathy Breen gave today about, about Iraq. And I think the discipline of our time is, is to, what we need to know is we need to know what's going on in the world in the big picture. We need to have the, the social, economic, political, global perspective is absolutely essential. And we, we need to study that. And as Ray was saying, we can do that before breakfast every morning these days. You know, we don't have any excuse that we can't get that information. We can have it and we must get it. And we need to know, and also, we need to know how these things affect children and shopkeepers and shepherds and people on, on uh, the people who uh, live in our hometowns and our neighbors. And I think I'll, I'll close with uh, a poem, a memorable, memorable fancy, William Blake, 18th century mystic, who had this vision. The prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel dined with me. And I asked them how they dared so roundly to assert that God spake to them, and whether they did not think at the time that they would, be, they would be misunderstood and so be the cause of imposition. Isaiah answered, I saw no God, nor heard any in the finite organical perception. But my senses discovered the infinite in everything. And I was then persuaded and remained confirmed that the voice of honest indignation is the voice of God. I cared not for consequences, but wrote. I'm tempted to uh, take a leaf out of Dan Berrigan's book. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but he was asked to speak at a university one time to give the commencement address. And he came up to the podium and he said, know where you stand, and stand there. <laughs> um, a couple of thoughts. Uh, I just passed 50 years of uh, living in the Washington area. Came down as a army officer, stayed there ever since. Uh, in 50 years, you see a lot of change, and there is one change that dwarfs all the other changes that I've observed. And that is that we no longer have, in any real sense, a free media. That is big. It could not be bigger. Thomas Jefferson, when he was asked uh, if you had a choice between a government and a free press, what would you choose? No problems. Free press every time. Edmund Burke, the one who coined the expression fourth estate. You know, 18th century English statesmen standing there in Parliament where there were three estates, two houses of commons and one of lords. He looked up at the balcony and he said, by far more important are you gentlemen. In those days, unfortunately, they were all gentlemen, or they called themselves gentlemen. <laughs> you up there in the balcony, you are far more important. You are the fourth estate, and you are more important because you keep us honest. That's gone, folks. That is gone. Now, what's the good news? The good news is that there's a fifth estate. And where is that fifth estate? Right here. Right here. I don't know where the ether is, but that's where it is, folks. It comes into your computer. That's the hope. And what we of our age and younger than me need to master are the techniques to figure out not only how to get the right information so that we're informed, but how to contact, how to get in touch, how to liaise with the younger generation. How many of you tweet? Okay, a couple do, right? I'm told, <laughs> I'm speaking like a hypocrite here, my, my, my son's gonna teach me how to tweet next week, okay? But if you don't take these rudimentary steps, not only to impress the younger generation by what you do, okay? I talked a little bit this morning about what your gray hair gives you a kind of privilege to do, get beaten up, but what you, how you act and how you respect the way young people get their information. I think that's really important. 
because I think Rabbi Heschel is right when he said long ago that, okay, uh, not all of us are guilty, but we all are responsible. Lastly, I'll just say this, uh, the preferential option for the poor was mentioned. It brings me back to when I was teaching CCD, uh, Sunday school in Catholic Provence at a parish in Washington, D.C. And uh, I was sort of, you know, at, at, at sea, so much so that they sent me to Georgetown University to get a gentleman's master's, you know, six, six <laughs> core courses. And in the, each one of those courses, uh, what came through loud and clear is that the only thing that Yahweh of the Hebrew Scriptures of Jesus of the New care about is that we do justice. And lo and behold, we got gutsy young bishops at that time, including Gumbleton and others, that did a pastoral message on war and peace. <coughs> gutsy, gutsy thing, okay? Next year, 84, they did one on the American economy. And they faced up to it and they said, look, you've heard a lot about this preferential option of the poor, right? Well, we're gonna tell you what it is. What it is is, no one is entitled to a mass still more of what he or she doesn't need when others are deprived of the basic necessities of life. Now, have you heard that from the pulpit? <laughs> You're not gonna hear it from the pulpit, folks. That means it's up to us. It's really up to us to, as Ellen has said, cash in that backpack of white privilege. Be willing to pull out all the things that we take for granted, our education and everything else, and put it at risk. And that's the final thing I'll say. It's nice to have principles. We all have principles, right? That's really nice to speak and defend your principles. But if there's nothing for which you will risk those principles, then you're not compassionate, because compassionate means to suffer with, okay? So, necks, necks are really nice things. They're convenient uh, connections between head and torso. I hate to be without a neck. But if there's nothing for which you will risk that neck, then it becomes your idol. And I don't think any of us think that necks are worthy of idol worship. <laughs> Let's put our necks on the line. Let's stick them out real far. Getting because I didn't have anything to say. I really, but I, I guess I would just like to say something. What do we need to know? Was the first question, and I have to say I um, I feel like I know too much. I don't want to know anymore because I'm already so disturbed. Uh, and I have to watch what information I take in because I hear so many sad stories and so much of what I do is, it seems over the last years, because of the distressful situation in this country and the suffering we are causing, the immeasurable suffering around the world because of our war of choices. Uh, I have to go to movies that are redemptive I won't read Dirty Wars. I can't deal with that heavy kind of book right now. I, I think we're at a Kairos moment. I mean, I've heard that, and yet I, it hasn't gone from my head to my heart yet, but I can sense that in these two days something is happening here. Uh, I wish I had had uh, Brian Terrell on tape, but we're taking him back with us to the Catholic Worker. And I hear the same thing from Steve and Kathy. I, and Ray and others, uh, something's happening here that needs, that I need to be hopeful about. Um, but I'm, I have to be careful because I, I feel very fragile and I feel crazy a lot of the time. And then a part of me says, if we don't feel crazy, something's wrong. <laughs> because everything is so convoluted. That, well, we just heard, just now, I mean, how do you, live with that, you know, and, and in Iraq, everybody I met would leave if they could. How tragic is that? They see no hope for the future. Um, so I'm going to leave hoping that this, that I'll begin to understand what this Kairos moment is. Uh, but I, I, I will just say one 
<laughs> I wasn't going to speak right. <laughs> I live at the Catholic Worker. It's not an easy place for me. And I always say, the city's white hairs, it's not the war. It's the Catholic Worker. And sometimes before I even go down to take a house ship, shift to make so soup, <laughs> I've already like murdered a couple people, you know? I've like, left the bathroom in a state of disarray, and I'm thinking, Oh, if I could just get a hold of them, you know? So I'll be journaling in the morning. That's one of my spiritual disciplines, you know? And please, help me to be kind today. And then I'll cross that out and I'll put, help me to be civil. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I do believe, and this is just my rambling on, is that violence begets violence. But goodness begets goodness. And that's what I think. So simply being here at, in this uh, site, and as I was walking around, I, I ran into this sign over here and, and sat there and looked at it a bit. And just to read the first and last lines of it, it says, speak no evil of, one, of no one, speak evil of no one. And then let all strive to cultivate friendships with those who surround them. And it sort of occurred to me as I read that, that that really was a statement of law. Not in the sense of the police are gonna come and arrest you if you don't obey this or that, but in the sense of the collective wisdom of a community brought together to set down rules, universal rules, for what is going to make the community work better. And I contrast something like that with the 50, 60, 100 page, page uh, opinions that you get out of the federal court nowadays. And one of the things that you know for certain is that the longer the opinion, the less sense it's going to make. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm sort of drawing the distinction, I think, between law based on the wisdom of the community that builds and enhances, and law that obfuscates and covers up and tries to hide crimes that are going on. And we have to distinguish between those. The, when we think of the law, we tend to think of the lawyers as the practitioners who are somehow going to make it all right, but they are working within the system that obfuscates and covers up and writes 50-page opinions. But when Moses brought the Ten Commandments down, it wasn't 50-page opinions he was bringing down. It was a ten, you know, two tablets. You can write the wisdom down, and that's what we have to make sure that people understand. The law at its heart is about coming together, speaking no evil of each other, of, of building each other up. One of the things that I learned in what we did uh, was the tremendous power of becoming in touch with a targeted community, an impacted community. Uh, for me, it was the Muslim community. I, I've, all of you have spoken very passionately and beautifully about other communities as well, and I recognize them. Uh, but the Muslim community for, was the one that I think I was introduced to. And, it was a way of grounding me, and grounding all of us, I guess, in our beliefs, in about what is important. And once you, are, you understand what they're going through, it becomes much easier to see a path, a way to go. You don't have to go down every single path that is possible in order to change things. Once you start with a community, you will generally have one or two paths that you can follow, which will make a difference. And if we all follow one or two paths that will make a difference, it will have an impact. Another thing that I, I think will make a difference is the idea of working toward common goals and languages. Uh, I know that when we started out, we were uh, completely tied up with the idea of the injustice to the scene. And we came out here and talked to the Darfur people, and they had a completely different version of what happened. They had a, a, a totally different fact situation. And it wasn't until we'd sort of worked on it a bit that we came up with a language of preemptive prosecution. Although there were different fact situations, there was a commonality about preemptive prosecution. And then we'd be able to talk with other Muslims about it using that kind of language. And then we could go to the African Americans and we can say preemptive prosecution is a way that they're going, it's a kind of a war on, on Muslims. But there's also a war going on with African Americans and with Latinos. And again, you can build bridges to start to bring different communities together so that they can all talk with one voice. And I, that